You know how at layer two you can segment traffic by using VLANs? Pretty cool capability. What about layer three? Well, it turns out that at layer three, we can actually segment traffic as well. And this is what we refer to as the VRF light feature. You see, virtual routing and forwarding tables are used heavily in MPLS environments, but if we go without MPLS, we can still partition traffic utilizing VRF light. Yeah, pretty cool. We can literally take particular traffic and give it its own routing tables in the infrastructure. We can segment the layer three traffic to utilize different interfaces, different routing tables. You know what? It would just be a lot easier if I were to go ahead and show you how VRF Lite functions. And let's do that in this micro nugget. Check out this topology that I built in GNS3. Look at this. We have these lab guys and they are constantly testing viruses and all kinds of mail malware and things of that nature. This is one of their systems. It's lab client one, and they have resources that they access through an edge device like this lab worldwide web server. Here we have a regular old client one in our infrastructure. They like to access resources from the World Wide Web device out here through the shared edge device. One of the problems with this infrastructure, oh, and by the way, notice we're going through a switch and the lab client one is in VLAN 20 and the client ones are in VLAN 10. They're partitioned on the VLAN side. But then when you get here to the edge device, yeah, everything starts blurring. There's a global routing table on the edge device that contains these, you know, routes, the 10, 10, 10 routes. And up here, we've got the 10, 20, 20 routes. Over here, we've got 192.168.20. And down here, we've got 192.168.10. The, the problem here with this infrastructure is we'd have to drop in a lot of different security mechanisms, and it'd be very, very complicated running around trying to partition things with like access control lists and things of that nature. Wouldn't it be nice if we could use virtual routing and forwarding light to go ahead and literally partition this infrastructure. Yeah, have two routing tables on the edge device, one for our safe clients and one for our dangerous lab client systems. Let's see what's going on right now in the infrastructure. So I'll go ahead and grab the, oh, let's go to the to the lab client device. So we'll go to the lab client device. And if I do a ping to their resources at 192.168.20.1, sure enough, they can access their particular resources out past the edge device. But look at this. And again, here's what we're really worried about. They're playing with all these viruses and all this nasty stuff, and they can easily reach the resources of our normal clients. So we really want to partition this layer three infrastructure with virtual routing and forwarding. Let's go to the edge device and let's do just that. Now here on the edge device, if I do a show IP interface brief, we can see the addressing that we have used on our interfaces for these respective devices. And if I do a show IP or let's do a show run, and we'll do section OSPF. So we have set up OSPF on this particular device as well. We've done passive interfaces towards the clients, and then we've run uh, OSPF towards those internet resources. All right, so we are about to turn things upside down a little bit on this particular device. You ready? We are gonna go in and first we need to create the virtual routing and forwarding tables that we want to utilize. So I'm gonna say IP VRF and we'll say lab rats. That's where we're gonna put our lab equipment. And then I'll say IP VRF clients. That's where we're gonna put our normal, safe, trusted client traffic. Okay, so we've created our VRFs. 
Now we're going to go into our interfaces and have them participate in these VRFs. I'm glad I have the IP addresses in our scenario in front of me because when we take an interface and add it to a VRF, it's going to lose its version 4 address. It's going to lose its version 4 capability and address. Wow. So I'm going to say interface, let's do E1 slash 0 first. And on, uh, oh, by the way, wait a minute here. I'm also going to get rid of our OSPF because we're going to be changing that configuration too. So I'm going to say no router OSPF1. We're going to blow away the OSPF config and you can see our adjacencies go down with our lab resources out there on the internet and our non-lab resources out there on the internet. Okay, great. We are ready to go. So I'm going to go into interface E1 slash 0. This particular interface, as you can see, had the address. In fact, I'll copy it to the clipboard. Yeah, that'll be a good move. So it had the 10, 20, 20. That's the lab rats uh, particular address space. I'm going to, under this interface, say IP VRF forwarding lab rats. And it says, okay, we just stripped off the IP address. No problem. I'm going to put it right back. IP address and mask. Okay, next up, interface E1 slash 1. What's the address? Let me go grab it. It'll be the 10, 10, 10 address. Okay, got it on the clipboard. And we're going to say IP VRF forwarding clients. The address is gone. I'll put it back in. Okay, we're going to continue this. What other addresses do we have? Well, we've got our addresses going out to the internet. There is the lab rats address, serial 2 slash 0. IP, VRF, forwarding, lab rats. The address is gone. I'll put it back. Boy, I sure hope we're getting paid per hour when we do these configs. It's kind of laborious, isn't it? Interface serial 2 slash 1. IP, VRF, forwarding, this is the client's interface, and the IP address is 192.168.10.100. Okay, we are done putting the interfaces into their respective virtual routing and forwarding environments. We can verify this. I'll do show IP VRF, and it says, okay, the client's are participating in these interfaces, the lab rats are participating in those interfaces. Awesome. Now, let's go ahead and fix our OSPF configuration to be aware of this virtual routing and forwarding environment. Simple. We say router, OSPF, process ID of one, you're in VRF, lab rats. And then we go in with our configuration. I'll say network, 192.168.20.100, you're in area zero. And network, and look at that, the adjacency just came up. So what's going on out there on the World Wide Web devices? Nothing, no change out there on those World Wide Web devices. Yeah, they just... They're just making their adjacency with the appropriate VRF. The VRF is a local config to this edge device. It doesn't impact that device out there that needs to make an adjacency with this device. Pretty cool. The network 10.10, uh, no, I'm sorry. This is lab rats we're working with. 10.20.20.100 is our lab rats internal interface. We'll put that in area zero, and we'll make that passive, by the way. So passive interface E1 slash 1. Uh-oh, doesn't belong to this process. Let's see, I got the wrong uh, address identifier there. So it's E1 slash 0. Okay, great. 
there we go. So it won't even let you make a mistake. I love that, how the router does that. All right, next up is our router OSPF process ID of two VRF clients. Notice different process IDs now for these different OSPF processes that coordinate to the different VRF tables. Pretty cool. I'm going to say network 10.10.10.100. And that's in area zero. I'm going to say 192.168.10.100. That's in area zero. And we should establish an adjacency with the internet resource. And we do. And then finally, I'm going to say passive interface E1 slash 1. All right. Look at this. Based on our configuration, if we do a show IP route, this is so crazy. All of the routes are gone. The global routing table is empty. Remarkable. If we do show IP route VRF lab rats, for example, we see, ah, yes, all of the routing information for the virtual routing and forwarding table of lab rats has been tucked into this partition, if you will. And then, of course, we could do that for clients as well. There's the clients addressing. If you do show IP OSPF neighbor, you see that we are adjacent with the World Wide Web resources out there. All right. So the end result of this is our partitioned layer three infrastructure. And we can obviously test this very easily, can't we? Remember earlier in this video, I went in and said, okay, Remember earlier in this nugget, I went in and said, okay, I can ping the lab rat stuff from the lab client. Of course, we want that access, but we were very troubled by the fact that we could reach out to the regular client resources. Well, I'm thinking that's going to be different now. First, let's try the lab client pinging the internet lab rat resources. Okay, it works just fine. Now, this is the big test. Can this lab client access resources of the normal clients? It once could, as we see right up here by this ping result. What happens now? Now it's unreachable. Absolutely. Because this traffic is coming into an interface, participating in the lab rat infrastructure. There is no knowledge in that virtual routing environment of the normal client stuff. In this micro nugget, we took a look at VRF Lite. This micro nugget is indeed a slice out of Scott Morris's and myself's CCIE routing and switching preparation course. And this is from the layer three technologies course. We have six courses that make up the full complement of CCIE routing and switching version five training. I encourage you to check that training out at CBT Nuggets, especially if you enjoyed this presentation. Well, I sure hope this particular micro nugget was informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.